we go. How does that look to you? That looks absolutely fine. Yep, yeah, very clear. Great. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for um, inviting me along this evening. Um, I hope this makes sense. I, I, we had a little run through yesterday and um, I, <laughs> Ian pointed out that I was possibly had too many slides and it was going to be too long and that we didn't want to scare you off with the first talk. Um, so hopefully this will be short and sweet and um, we, yeah, there'll be time for questions. Um, so rather than me uh, kind of uh, enforcing what I think you should know on you, uh, you can ask what you want to know. Um, okay, so I work for Wild Oxfordshire. We're a local conservation group um, and you can visit our website and um, find out more about us if you, if you would like to know more about us. Oh, here we go. Hang on. It's a good start. Why can't I move it? There we go. Okay, so um, so we're not going to talk about uh, wind pollination this evening. Um, we're mainly going to focus uh, on animal pollinators and specifically on bees. But we need a little bit of background um, to. Uh, uh, at the beginning. Um, we, we really need pollinators. In fact, uh, you know, there wouldn't be life without them, I don't think. Um, they contribute huge amounts to our well-being through the fact that they pollinate our food. Um, and if we didn't have insect pollinated food, um, I'm not entirely sure what, <laughs> what we would have to eat, but uh, it wouldn't be nearly as interesting or nutritious. And of course, uh, Plants that have been pollinated by insects um, and other animals, such as bats um, and small mammals, also provide us with um, uh, uh, fibres and medicines. And in fact, 75% uh, of um, our food crops uh, involve some sort of animal pollination uh, to the tune of somewhere up to, um, you know, just under $600 billion um, a year's worth. Um, and in the UK, uh, uh, it, it, uh, the, it, the value of um, insect pollination um, was estimated to be about 430 million pounds um, in 2011. But um, yeah, since that, uh, I think it's um, it's been generally decided that actually it's more, but nobody can really put a figure on it. But I, I think that probably sort of demonstrates um, the fact that uh, it's it's sort of beyond monetary value, um, and of course. It goes beyond just supplying food for us. 90% of our flowering plants are pollinated by animals. And um, it's not just us that relies on that. It's, it's you know, uh, food, it provides, this provides food for other sort of animals. Um, flowering plants stabilize our soils. I mean, the list is enormous. Um, so what exactly does pollination gives us? Well, it gives us, we know about honeybees and honey. So pollination gives us food um, in the form of honey. And then also all these wonderful fruit and vegetables that we, we, we love and need so much. And of course our gardens, the flowers that we enjoy looking at, um, a lot of them are pollinated by insects. And our wildflower meadows, so wild plant communities, and all the other insects and the birds and the wildlife that rely on them and uh, livestock forage. We know that um, cattle that have fed solely on grass are nowhere near as healthy as um, uh, those that are uh, fed on, on a much di more diverse sward. And without pollination, we wouldn't have all the wonderful berries in our hedgerows that go to feed uh, the birds and the small mammals. And of course, um, birds feed uh, directly on insects such as uh, bumblebees, that's a shrike. Uh, they're famous predators of bumblebees. And of course, there are the secondary benefits as well. Um, pollinators such as bees have been um, important to us culturally for, for, um, for millennia. Um, and People such as myself love watching them and take great joy of sitting in a field and listening to the buzzing around us. Um, and of course, looking at butterflies and beetles as well. 
and indeed the soil protection provided by the cover, provided by the pollination um, uh, is also really important and, in, and those soils and of course the, the sward, the flowering sward also provides a filter for, for water and they indeed store carbon as well. So there's a lot of primary and secondary benefits derived from pollination and pollinating insects. And it's not just the bees, there are also, um, I'm sure you're all aware, but it's really worth remembering um, the butterflies and moths, hoverflies, flies and beetles. And um, although this talk really focuses on bees, um, I think what we need to bear in mind, just because you, you know you do need to have a focus, otherwise, otherwise you if you try and do it all, you start to go crazy. But um, you know what is what is good for what is good and what is bad for the bees tends to be good and bad for the rest of these insects here. Um, so just by narrowing it down and thinking about bees, um, it sort of helps, I think. Um, so you know we are increasingly aware of of the fact that there is um, a real problem with our um, with well declining biodiversity in general but particularly um, a lot of work has been done on pollinating insects uh, I think really because first of all they're incredibly important to us economically but also um, they're really well studied uh, suite of insects so there's a good there's a good um, uh, sort of base of data um, for which people can calculate uh, declines um, in the populations and uh, if you want to know I mean people argue the whole time over exactly what the percentage is I don't think it really matters paper after paper after paper shows that there is a decline whether it's 30 percent or 40 percent you know there is a there has been a persistent decline um, and the reason this says 1980 to 2013 is because this is the data set that was being used here um, a recent article um, in British wildlife came out suggesting that actually the decline had been was in fact started pre-war um, somewhere in the 20s um, and this paper by Powney et al uh, uh, Gary Powney is based at the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology in Wallingford uh, if you can get him to talk to you then um, that would be really enlightening because he uh, he crunches all the numbers um, but uh, so basically, uh, the UK is divided up into um, a one kilometer grid squares uh, and there are recorders, the recording groups for butterflies, hoverflies, moths and bees, wasps and ants. Uh, and over the years, people have been busy collecting data from each of these grid squares um, and analysing it. And basically what this shows that in 71% um, of the grid squares, there's been a decline in butterflies, 66 in hoverflies, 66 in moths, bees and so on. Um, there are other insects that are also classified as pollinators and the overall picture is a 33% decrease um, in wild pollinators across the UK. Um, so this isn't just species, this is actually coverage as well. And um, we have had some new arrivals as well, so it's not complete losses. There are arrivals, uh, some in, um, uh, you know, some transported here and some that have arrived here uh, naturally. So thinking about bees, so amazingly, there are over 250 species of bees um, in the UK. And most familiar to us, of course, are the honeybee, is the honeybee and the bumblebees. And then there are all these other bees. And the bumblebees and the honeybees are social bees and the rest are just for simplicity's sake, we'll call them um, solitary bees, although there are some that are sort of in the middle between social and solitary. Um, and it is incredible because they these largely get overlooked. And whenever you read articles about, about bees and the decline in bees and how wonderful bees are, very often what you do is you you see that there's a, there'll be a picture of a bumblebee and and then it'll go on to talk about honeybees. Um, so I think the sort of general knowledge around bees is is not so great. And, and I think mainly that's because a lot of them are small and brown and, um, and largely go about their, their business um, sort of 
in a very low key way. Um, and it's thought that we've lost uh, 24 species from the UK since records began. Um, and Folk, uh, the name at the top in the title, is, is um, he's the sort of, he's the final word in, in uh, sort of B classification in this country. He's absolutely brilliant. And um, I'll show you a book of his later if you have to get one book on bees. I think his is, is the one. Um, so, I often, um, I, I often give a talk about bumble, I used to give a talk a lot about bumblebees and, and it slowly adapted because the same, the same comments would come back um, after, after each talk, which was, um, oh, I, I'm doing loads for bees. We, we've, um, we've just got five new hives of honeybees in our garden. Um, you know, I really want to help pollination and, and this, is, uh, this is the way I'm going to help pollinators. And, and the thing is, honeybees are not really very good pollinators they're absolutely brilliant at making honey nothing comes nothing comes close to them <laughs> for making honey um, but actually they're not the best pollinators so if you want to make honey by all means um, you know keep bees have beehives uh, it's the most amazing um, sort of science and art and philosophy and I have huge respect for beekeepers and their understanding of, of just how the colony works because it's it's really complex um, but beekeeping is not the answer to the pollination crisis um, and you know with millions of years of evolution uh, with, with our with our plants and our insects um, you know if if that if that link if that pollination link is being fragmented and, and broken um there is you know it stands to reason there's no way you can just rebuild that link with with one species just by pumping out honeybees um uh, i found myself saying to to the banbury ornithological society the other day you know you guys fully understand that if you want to save the birds you don't just throw out chickens chickens are great if you want eggs but um you know it's not going to save the birds. You'll just end up with loads of chickens. Um, so there is huge difference between, and, and the, the, I suppose the reason, the key, the key point with why honeybees are not great pollinators comes with the way um, they collect uh, their pollen. And basically what, so this is a bumblebee on the right, Bombus pascorum, and this is a honeybee on the left. And these two bees, these social bees, they have big colonies, huge colonies to feed, and they need to be really efficient at their, their foraging. And what they do is they, they collect pollen on their bodies and they groom that pollen down uh, into, you can see here, into these pollen baskets on their leg. And you see this Bombus pascorum here. You know, it, there's hardly a pollen grain on its body and um, all the pollen is tightly packed into this specially, specially evolved basket on its leg. And then it can take that back to the colony. So they're really efficient at collecting pollen and not so efficient at transferring pollen for obvious reasons, because that pollen in that basket is simply not available to be transferred onto the next plant. Solitary bees transport dry pollen so mining bees, for example, which are the ones that make the little um, volcanoes in the football pitches, you know, in the bare earth. Mining bees transfer the pollen sort of loosely on the coarse hairs on their legs. But you can see there, it's not packed in and it's not wet. That is dry and fluffy and available for, for transfer onto the next flower that it, it um, visits. And these are leaf cutter bees. And they do the same thing, but in these kind of funny little bottle brush type things that occur on their abdomen. So again, that, that pollen is very available uh, to, to knock off or, or, or to sort of transfer onto a, 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 another flower. And again, another um, uh, scientist from CH, Ben, ben Woodcock, uh, in 2013, he showed that um, solitary bees not only spend longer on oilseed rape flowers, 
um, but actually the trans the pollen transfer from bee to plant is much higher, uh, 71%, just over 71% in solitary bees, whereas it's somewhere around 35% in um, bumblebees and honeybees. So solitary bees, uh, if you see them on, if you watch them, something like um, an apple flower, you'll see, you know, it's cup shaped. You can really see what's going on in an apple flower. A lot of the solitary bees have this amazing action where they roll around in a sort of a figure of eight around the cup of the um, apple flower. And that is really good for pollen, well, pollen collection and pollen transfer as well. That's how they do it. Whereas if you watch a honeybee, it'll come in, it'll extract the nectar, um, and and gather a bit of pollen but it's it's you know it doesn't have that weaving action and even if it did you know the pollen would be rammed into its pollen basket so the the transfer is just less efficient and i think what a lot of um we did some work with a uh, an orchard down in hampshire and they are doing you know they've moved on from putting honeybee hives at the end of each row of of uh, apple trees and they're moving on to try and encouraging as many my, um solitary bees onto the site as possible so so if we look at this we're thinking okay bumblebees and honeybees they're not bumblebees uh, are about as bad as honeybees at transferring um pollen. But what bumblebees do, which is really, really special, is they have this amazing um, uh, action called buzz pollination. And they, um, and I normally play a video, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't agree with um, Zoom. But uh, so basically, things like um, tomatoes and aubergines, um, it, it, Creating, creating pollen is a really expensive thing for um, plants. Uh, it's very high in protein, which is why the bees want it, because they need it to feed their, their larvae. Um, so bees uh, extract, you know, so the plants produce nectar, uh, which is a lure. It's like a reward for the bees to visit the plants so that um, the nectar is, uh, so that the pollen is collected and transported um, and transferred. Um, but it is expensive to produce. And so the plants want to be sure that um, as much, po as much uh, pollen as possible is not wasted. And anyway, tomatoes and aubergines uh, hold the, the pollen really tightly in anthers. And basically it's only bumblebees and a, a type of blue banded bee in Australia um, that, are able to do this buzz pollination where they hold on to the anthers and they buzz. They contract their flight muscles and produce really strong vibrations and it causes the anther to de-hiss and to just to basically burst pollen everywhere and cover the, the bumblebee in pollen. And um, that is an amazing thing that bumblebees do. Um, and honeybees definitely can't do this and most solitary bees can't do it either. So bumblebees are really important for some flower pollination. And of course, you know, they, they get covered in pollen in the process when it, it, in this video, you can Google it, um, look it up on YouTube, but you'll see that as the pollen, as the anther explodes and releases the pollen, you know, the bumblebee gets absolutely smothered in it and it will be able to groom down a lot of the pollen into its pollen baskets, but of course it will always miss bits. And so this is the range of uh, plants um, in the UK anyway, that, or that we, yeah, it, these were all taken in a garden in um, Little Whitnam. But, uh, you know, bumblebees are particularly good at pollinating um, beans and apples, uh, and they're particularly good at tomatoes and raspberries as well. So we really, really need our, our um, our bumblebees and our solitary bees, as well as the honeybees. But releasing honeybees is not going to cure the pollination um, problem. So what are the causes of decline? Well, like the causes of decline of most things, whether it's um, mammals or birds or other insects, loss of quality habitat, overuse of pesticides, uh, disease, um, and all of the above with a bit of climate change thrown in. 
and this this picture on the right is um it shows a man pollinating pear trees in china and he's got this bamboo stick and on the end they've got um cigarette butts you know the the white they've peeled off the paper and you've got all these hairy white bits on there for pollinating your your pears uh when you have uh killed off all your native pollinators so um, I'm going to go, I'm just going to go through these causes of decline. Um, so we, it's thought that we've lost about 97% of our, our flower rich grasslands since 1930. Um, so you can imagine that that's, um, that's absolutely devastating to, to uh, things that feed on flowers and live in <laughs> flower rich grasslands. Um, and not only that, but um, the hedgerows have also been removed. I mean, this is a familiar sight to, to all of us, these sort of huge fields without hedgerows, just monocultures um, being subjected to quite heavy uh, sprays and fertilizers and general nasties. Um, it's a rather bucolic scene at the top. You can see a nice sort of mosaic of habitats all being cut by hand. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, agri-environment schemes have attempted to redress this, but um, have only kind of recreated 0.3% of what is needed. So that hasn't really made much of a dent. Um, you know, there's, uh, if you're an optimist, you'll, you'll hope that the new, uh, with the, the new ELM schemes will, will um, go a bit further. And then there's pesticides, famously the ne nicotinoids, but, um, you know, a pesticide kills pests, um, stroke insects, uh, and whether it's an aphid um, or a weevil, they're all insects um, and bees and other insects operate and, you know, they have the, sort of the same morphology and find the same things toxic. toxic. Um, so, you know, these chemicals may be targeted at one particular species. And it's the same, in fact, with the chemicals in, in the garden center, you know, it might have aphids on the packet, but um, just because you want it to kill aphids, it doesn't mean it's only going to kill aphids. Um, they're insecticides, they kill insects. Um, the interesting thing about nicotinoids is that they were in fact developed to be much, much more targeted so that you didn't have to spray the whole countryside. Uh, in in insecticides um, to get rid of the flea beetle. So actually, the the actual seed of the oilseed rape is coated in the um, neonicotinoid, which and then as the plant grows, the the chemical is systemic. So it grows up through the shoots as the plant sprouts, and as the plant grows, it it um, is spread throughout the plant. But the problem is, it's ends up in the pollen and the nectar as well. So of course, along come the bees and they get a quite a high dose of neonix. Um, so, but, uh, I mean, it, it's hard to know. There's been a lot of studies. Again, Ben Woodcock did a fantastic study, um, slightly rather unpopular study on neonix. Um, uh, unpopular with Syngenta, um, that, basically showed that, you know, you didn't end up with piles of dead bees, but it was neurotoxic, but at a sublethal level. So actually the bees didn't drop dead in huge amounts, but they just didn't, they didn't behave and they didn't function as they should do. Um, and that made the whole colony uh, sort of, you know, ineffective. Um, and then when you've got all the other things going on as well, if you've got loss of habitat and they're having to work extra hard to feed the colony, um, uh, then if you've got a whole load of bees that aren't quite sort of working as they should, it's, it, you know, it's a, it's a downward slope. And also they uh, neonics affect uh, the reproductive success in wild bees um, and it shortens their lives. And as a result, um, uh, I think finally, uh, the chemical was was banned, partially banned, was banned in circum certain circumstances. But um, as we saw earlier on this spring, derogations can be applied for, um, which it, which is better than nothing, in my opinion. But then, then what do you do? Then what have you got? If you if you ban the neonics, you know you're back to sort of spraying the other stuff. Um, 
was something else I wanted to say about this. And, uh, and of course, you know, the, the work has been done on honeybees and to a certain extent bumblebees as well, because you can keep them and you can, um, you know, you can keep them in experimental conditions and actually see what's going on. And of course, you can't do that with wild bees. You can't do it with solitary bees. So the impact uh, that these chemicals are having on the solitary bees is um, is poorly known. But I think one has to assume that it's it's pretty much um, the same. Uh, and of course, disease, um, you know, disease in insects and in animals, parasites, you know, they've all got parasites, they've all got diseases, that's so completely normal. But when you get high stocking densities um, and um, badly managed colonies of uh, honeybees, um, you know, rather like we've seen with the pandemic, you know, you've got lots of people stuffed together, behaving not quite as they should be and not looking after their hygiene, or, yeah. um, then uh, you will get a really rapid uh, increase in disease transmission. Um, but of course, again, with, you know, with honeybees, you see, you can see what's happening with them. You know, the beekeepers visit their honeybee net, uh, colonies, hives, and they can see what's happening and they've got the medicines and they can treat them. Um, but actually, of course, what's happening is that you know, this disease is, is spilling out, out of the honeybees and into bumblebees and other wild bees. And um, whilst the honeybees can be treated, the bumblebees, you know, you don't often see bumblebee nests and you rarely see solitary bee nests and you certainly can't go about treating them. So while the honeybees can be treated for diseases, um, the wild bees can't. Um, so, and, and, there has been um, there are a lot of studies to show that that um, wild bees are now um, that have also the honeybee diseases. Um, uh, quite a big problem. Um, so the the Dutch um, obviously for the for the um, tomato trade um, uh, have got really quite intense captive bee uh, bumblebee. Um, they breed bumblebees to pollinate the tomatoes and the other fruit and veg in the polytunnels um, and so you've got again unnaturally um, uh, highly uh, densely stocked colonies of bumblebees in small areas and again the disease transmission is 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 really quite intense um, and of course the problem is uh, you know in 1988 in the 80s and 90s no one was looking at um, what was in uh, the diseases in in these commercially traded um, bumblebee colonies, and so of course they were moved around as as people realised that actually the pollination was going down and they needed to supplement that with commercially um, bred bumblebees. You know these boxes were being shipped all over the world, and off go the diseases. Um, and of course, you know in time on a style uh, tradition. <laughs> um, uh, people were shipping um, bombers colonies from Europe off to South America, where uh, their bumblebees, they've got very few bumblebee species because they're sort of at the end of the evolutionary chain, but um, they are big and they're very, very different to our bumblebees. And of course our diseases arrive there in commercial colonies and absolutely rip through um, the native bumblebees of uh, South America, which is a huge shame. And insanely, it's still going on. Um, so it's not good. So uh, drivers of decline. So we've outlined um, uh, habitat loss and with that habitat loss comes, um, you know, loss of, of a sort of wide range of um, nutritional quality. So they've got less food, poorer quality food. Um, and we've got the diseases that we spoke of in the insecticides and then there's climate change as well and you sort of you can drill down and see that um, pathogens and insecticides affect you know the DNA and the RNA so they're sort of subcellular and then they also affect the cellular the bees at a cellular level um, and if those things in fact uh, affect it, individual behavior that also affects the colony in in um, in bumblebees and honeybees at the very least and you know as many colonies are affected then that affects population and um and then we look up here and we see that you know there's climate change also affects populations and then you know 
the range across the whole across the whole country. So that's a sort of snapshot of what we're looking at. So we know what the problem is, or I think we, we kind of think we know a bit of what the problem is, and what's the solution. So um, so like I've said earlier on, releasing loads of honeybees um, to tackle pollination, the pollination crisis is not the answer. And um, M&S got into a lot of trouble a couple of weeks ago by saying they were going to release 30 million honeybees onto their farms uh, to, <laughs> to help pollination and help pollinators and generally tackle biodiversity loss. And that didn't go down well at all. Uh, Yo, Yo Valley um, said exactly the same. And you know, if they if they wanted to put these, if if they'd made these announcements and then said, oh, and by the way, we're going to create, um, you know, three hundred thousand or restore three hundred thousand hectares of wildflower meadows, um, you know, that would have been something completely different. But just chucking out more honeybees is not going to help um, the big scheme of things. And the British Beekeepers Association is the most fantastic organisation, and they, um, you know, they they were the first one on on twitter saying ah that's no 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 you've got that wrong so they um anyway they've changed their website slightly um so this is you know this is what happens in america you see these huge huge trucks of bee uh bee um honeybee colonies being shipped around america from um you know the cranberries to the blueberries to the oranges to the almonds on the west coast and uh, you know, that's, it, even if you think about it from, a, you know, a, a COVID point of view, does that, that map of the movement of diseased things around the world is just, you know, hideous. But again, you know, they've got antibiotics. They think they can, um, you know, treat, treat their way out of the problem. Whereas, of course, originally, there were all the pollinators you needed. But, you know, the system is broken. So what can you do to help? Well, there's a lot that we can do. And the most important thing I think is to understand why, what you need to do and why you need to do it. And then, um, you know, it's the teach the man to fish kind of thing. Um, it, becomes, it becomes easy if you understand what they need. Um, so basically we need to create more quality flower rich patches, whether that's in gardens or in the countryside, preferably in meadows. And, uh, undisturbed sites for nesting and hibernation and refuges from pesticides. Monitor and record and obviously get the kids involved and inspire the next generation. So uh, bumblebee life cycles, I'm going to focus on bumblebees because I like them and I understand them. Um, but so this is what happens in a bumblebee life cycle. So just before, um, over winter, so right now, what we're seeing is huge queens, aren't we? We're seeing huge bumblebees in your garden flying around. Um, and those are the queens that hatched last year, last autumn or last summer, and they mated last winter and then they hibernated. And each queen mates once. Um, and right now we're seeing them emerging in spring and they have got to set up their colony right now. Um, and they need a lot of pollen to do that. So first of all, they need nectar to feed themselves to, you know, as fuel to enable them to fly around collecting pollen. And they, they get all the pollen and they stash it in their little mouse hole or under the shed or in a grave, under a grave. Um, and once they think they've got enough to um, provide for their larvae, uh, they start to lay uh, eggs. And the eggs will... Um, turn into larvae and the larvae will turn into worker workers oh, hang on um, so she forages 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 collects the pollen and then um, she founds the nest and it's it's um it's sort of similar but different to the honeybees it's nowhere the uh, bumblebee nest is nowhere near as well organized as um, a honeybee nest um, they but they do build these beautiful little cups which they fill with with um, with uh, pollen and some nectar. And 
the nest develops. So basically the, the queen will keep laying um, fertilized eggs, which will turn into workers. And eventually what happens is that she um, starts to lose the ability to fly. Her, their wings go pretty quickly. They become, um, you know, they sort of crack and fray. And eventually she won't be able to fly. But by that point, if all has gone well, she should have um, created enough workers to do the work for her. And then she will just lay and lay and lay and lay until she runs out of sperm. So all the sperm is stored inside her. And when she um, lays fertilized eggs, they become workers. And when she stops, when she runs out of sperm, she will carry on laying eggs, but they are not fertilized and they will become males. And uh, the point at which the males are, start hatching is pretty much the point at which the colony declines because the males don't contribute to the colony. They, 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 the larvae metamorphose, they become a male, they leave the nest and then they just fly around and the males do not collect pollen because they contribute nothing to the nest. Um, so all the males need is uh, nectar to keep going and they um, sleep or they, they overnight, um, you know, hanging upside down under a, uh, you know, a foxglove leaf or something like that. Um, and their sole purpose is to find the new queens coming out of the nest and mate with them. And then the whole thing starts again. Um, and the males, uh, they look quite similar to the females. They've got, um, they've got one extra segment on their antenna. Um, so they've got 13 rather than 12 segments. So they kind of have these funny little droopy antennae. And you can often tell um, males, they, they often, uh, towards the end of the summer, you see them all over um, thistles. And they're covered, they do get, they're covered in pollen because they don't groom the pollen off their bodies. So they just have this sort of incidental pollen on themselves. Um, and they just kind of loll around in the sunshine on the top of thistles, sipping nectar and having a final time. So that's the bumblebee life cycle. Um, solitary bees have got a sort of a, a similar life cycle except for they uh, don't have this whole sort of they don't provision for the nest in a sort of in a in a social way they each each female has um, her own little hole uh, her own little nest often they nest in aggregations but they're very much uh, provisioning for their own larvae they don't have this sort of um, social system so so what you need to do is provide lots of nectar and pollen from very early on in the year, particularly and particularly early on in spring. It's really important to have enough ne um, pollen for for the bees. Um, so Mahonia is a great thing. Um, this is sort of in the garden, I suppose, really. Mahonia is a great thing because that flowers throughout the winter and um, increasingly we're seeing a lot of um, bees active in our warmer winters so you need we need to have uh, enough pollen and nectar to keep um, the bees going that wake up quite early because it's quite warm. Um, crocuses are great for, for pollen as are willows and pulmonaria um, and uh, like I said, later on in the summer you need um, enough nectar to keep the males and the newly emerged queens going. The other thing you need to bear in mind is, is tongue length, would you believe it? So um, bumblebees uh, have a huge range, different species have, a, they've got a big range in tongue length. So Bombus hortorum is um, our common garden bumblebee and it's got a 14 millimeter long tongue length. Um, and uh, so this is, um, this is the honeybee with a seven millimeter long tongue length and the, um, the little, uh, for example, mining bees, solitary bees have got really short tongues. So the longer tongue um, bumblebees prefer um, flowers with much deeper corollas, such as this acrylegia. The nectary is right at the base and it's rather like Darwin's finches and their, you know, their different beak shapes. This is a way of keeping all our bees sort of slightly, you know, everyone interested in a different type of flower. Uh, so they're not all foraging on one, on one resource. And, and what's quite, what's quite brilliant is, um, so, so the, 
things like honeysuckle and toad flax you know you often see the longer uh, the longer tongue bumblebees feeding on them and the short tongue the bum bombus terrestris the the uh, buff-tailed bumblebee um, has found a way of shortcutting the circuit and they will actually go right they'll go out on the outside so rather than sticking their face inside they'll go on the outside and bite a hole in the bottom of that and extract the nectar that way um, which which is fine which is good for them but actually it's no good for pollination because simply no no pollen transfers occurred um, and um, the other thing bearing in mind where you where South Stoke is, um, you know, the best possible thing you can do is plant a hedgerow for um, bees and pollinators, and in fact, for wildlife in general, actually. Um, but uh, and the great thing about hedgerows is not only do they provide the, the flowering resource, the floral resource, but you've also got that structure as well. And you've got all the wonderful nest sites at the base of a hedge for bees, but also, um, uh, well, everything, small mammals, um, you know, birds. Um, but also from a sort of butterfly um, and moth point of view, uh, there's huge amounts of uh, larvae, um, species, larval uh, caterpillars and things feed on um, hedgerows, even, even if uh, the flowers have gone over. Um, so hedgerows are just a brilliant thing for everything. Plant a hedgerow, if you can, you know, if you get, you know, you're in the countryside. Um, uh, yeah, bedding plants are, are no good. Don't worry about them. Um, they, they're expensive, they're grown in peat, they're drenched in insecticides, and on the whole they tend, that you know, they're sterile hybrids, so they don't really have any nectar and pollen. Um, so don't, don't bother with those. I mean, if you like looking at them, then of course, but don't, don't you're not gonna help pollinators with them. And nest sites, um, you can spend 17 pounds on one of these, but they don't work. Um, your nest site is basically if you leave your garden, let your garden, uh, you know, let the bees choose their own nest site. Uh, and um, we've got some, lots of cavity nesters. So Bombus hypnorum um, uh, is our newest arrival uh, bumblebee to arrive in this country. It arrived um, probably about 21 years ago. Um, and that loves a tree cavity or a bird nest box. Um, Bombus terrestris, you know, they're the ones that nest in the, sh uh, you know, in that hole, that hole under the shed or in under the gravestone. Um, and this is Lapidarius, which loves excavating. Um, well, actually, it doesn't really excavate so much, but it um, it loves a gap down the side of a, a, a tap in a wall. And you know, the, it'll this lasts for about eight weeks, eight or nine weeks, um, and they're not aggressive. And even um, I often get call, calls about um, swarming bees, swarming bumblebees. Actually, they're not swarming; they're the males dancing outside the cavity. And, and male bumblebees don't sting. Um, so, whether they're you know swarming or not, if they're males, um, they're not going to be a problem. And then you get the surface ne nesting bumblebees. Um, so, actually, this is quite a cool picture because you can see what their their nest looks like. Um, uh, these are the sort of slightly more primitive um, bumblebees and they nest on the surface of the ground and they card together, they're carder bees and they bring together moss and dry grass over the top of their nest. These um, are quite easy to disturb if you're raking up your garden. So, but the good news is if you do rake um, and you realise quite quickly, you can actually cover them back up again and they're pretty, they're pretty good at um, just forgetting about it and carrying on their lives. So nice bit, nice corner of wild gardens um, are really good for nesting bees and just don't, don't worry, they won't be there for very long um, and they're really not aggressive and they're in such, you know, there's maximum 200, uh, at the peak of the colony size will be 200 bees maximum in there um, and they, they're very um, focused on what they're doing, they don't, they don't really chase after you. And solitary bees, um, they just need they need to be left alone and they need you not to worry about the fact that they're biting holes in your, <laughs> in your um, rose, uh, rose leaves. Um, but again, you know, if you see these little wonderful volcanoes erupting on your lawn, don't worry about it. They'll be gone really quickly. Um, certainly don't spray them. Um, some people spray them. 
and a bumble um yes bumblebee uh, nest boxes don't work but um solitary bee hotels do um and they're really fun to look at um i mean ideally you just create some wild space or leave wild space for them but um I suppose if you've got children or if you want to really have a good look at what's going on, then you can build yourself a, um, a bee hotel. And, and of course, they can be really amazing feats of engineering as well as just um, sticks tied together <laughs> or, or posts with holes drilled in them. Um, and of course, the best thing you can do for solitary bees actually in the autumn is not to not to cut down all your fennel um, stalks uh or your um you know your hogweed or your anthriscus um uh leave those because actually that's what you're you're sort of recreating here with the bee hotels you're creating those sort of stalks that the the, the solitary bees can um uh get into and and raise their young from um Mylan ford in in um in in oxford have gone really gone to town and built themselves a bee bank, um, which has been fantastically successful. Uh, first of all, they created a wildflower meadows and then um, they decided that actually they needed a bee bank as well to provide um, a home for the solitary bees. Um, and think about where in your in, in South Stoke and beyond that you can influence, you know, the playing fields, can they not be mown so much? And, the same with the churchyards and anyway you've got green space um uh we worked recently with some health centers in oxford to improve their gardens their green spaces for um pollinators um do you have control over your ro road verges um in which case you know is it could you leave them to grow a bit longer for a bit longer um I don't know if you're getting any new developments, but actually that's quite a good, you know, there are some places like Benson where they don't really have much community owned um, green space to influence. Uh, new developments are offering um, an opportunity for getting some, you know, decent hedgerows in and um, some good planting for pollinators. But probably more you're around South Stoke, you know, who are your landowners? Are are your landowners on your parish council? Are they are they friends? I can imagine you're probably a lot more sort of, you know, all integrated, <laughs> um, a bit better. Um, you know, can you influence your landowners? Can you help them maintain their hedgerows, plant new hedgerows, suggest? Um, you know, the, the great thing about hedgerows is that they do actually protect grassy areas and meadows from pesticide drift you know they catch a lot of um the pesticides that are sprayed and fertilizers and things that are sprayed um that's uh that's it's another good reason for having hedgerows particularly around things like communities well around orchards um and um fruit you know where you grow fruit and veg Roselle, we should yes. probably get onto some questions in a couple yes. of minutes that's okay. just one one quick thing, a, a little project for you guys. Um, this is an amazing bee, the yellow loosestrife bee. And on the right is its map of its distribution. As you can see, it can run from Norfolk to, um, it runs from Norfolk to Dorset in its distribution. And on the map, if we zoom in, it's been found in Sidelings Cops up in North Oxford and Whiteham and Dint Dinton Pastures in Reading and it feeds on yellow loosestrife and this is yellow loosestrife which grows in wet areas such as ditches and bogs and rivers uh riversides and um yellow loosestrife has been found it basically is is all along the thames so i'm thinking i wonder if you guys can identify yellow loosestrife around South Stoke and try and find this bee because I think it's under recorded um, because people haven't looked for it. It's a tiny brown bee um, and you can look it up on, on the internet um, and try and find it in South Stoke and beyond. Um, just briefly, some resources. This habitat creation and management for pollinators is brilliant. If you want to create more um, uh, wildflower meadows that you can't get better than that. Uh, this book, if you want one book, that's your book. 
And Stephen Falk, the author, also has a brilliant Flickr site. So you can um, go on there and, and, um, and, send, and also send him photos to get him to try and identify um, any bees that you found. You can join a recording society. And there are some brilliant, brilliant um, citizen science. There's two citizen science programs that I particularly like. Uh, I record for butterflies is, is just wonderful. Um, and the pollinator monitoring scheme as well. UK pollinator monitoring scheme um, is, is a really good scheme and easy. There you go. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> uh, thank you very much. That was really enlightening and beautifully delivered. Um, I'd like to give you a huge thank you from South Stoke Wildlife Group and I'm sure Everybody on mute would like to give you a hand clap, a muted hand clap, anyway, you can hear me. Thank you very much. Um, we have about five minutes for some questions and I've sort of garnered some from, from here. Uh, let's just take some, a couple of these have been answered, but I'll, I'll go with, uh, from Paul Jenkins, do you think there should be controls and limits on the density and location of honeybee colonies in order to protect wild bees from foraging, competition, and disease. Gosh, uh, do you know what? I, I've never even thought of that because it's just so, um, I don't know, it's so prescriptive. It's, it's such a shame to have to do that to something that's so, such an amazing thing, keeping, keeping bees. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think probably some of, I think it's more about education, isn't it? And more about the people who are, maybe there should be licenses or maybe you should have to go on a training program or something to just help you understand the impact of your bees and of, of yeah, honeybees. Um, it's all about education, I think, and just, and, and more habitat. You know, if we had more habitat, if we created more habitat, then it, it you know it probably wouldn't be a problem. Um, but it's just we, you know this, it's an ever shrinking puddle, I think is is the problem. Okay, uh, let's move on to this one from Helen Walkington, which it says, in case this doesn't get covered, should the focus for the future be on creating habitat for pollinators or removing pesticides? I basically, what is the top priority for the pollination crisis? Do you think? Uh, I think it's it's more habitat. I think it's more habitat for everything, you know, uh, for biodiversity, you know, the, the loss of habitat, the fragmentation of habitat, um, and the quality of habitat is is just declining. And um, that's what we need. We more, need more land for nature, whether it's for bees or birds or mammals or whatever. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, Stop working. Penny, what can we do to encourage wild bees into our gardens? I think you've covered that one with, with your um, slide on, on flowers. So we'll move on to, uh, from David Moss. Dave Moss, sorry. Is any female bumblebee capable of becoming a queen or are there specific females which are raised as virgins? Um, I think it's, um, it's, it's to, I think it's to do with food. Um, uh, and it's also to do with the point at which um, uh, the the larvae hatch in the colony and the density of workers. There's all sorts of things going on. I'm not even sure if it's properly understood. When I was doing my PhD, there was somebody looking at this exactly this question, and um, by after five years, she was more confounded than when she started. So. Um, uh, the answer is I don't really know, but I th there are multiple things at play, and it's it's um, it's not that straightforward. <laughs> well, if you've done a PhD in it and don't know well, <laughs> it's heavy does. Um, and a final one. Let's go from this one from Paul again. Uh, uh, do you think that the ban on neonicotinoids, if it is sustained, means there will be better prospects for our wild bees? It rather depends. You see, the problem is the ban came in quite quickly. So I think, um, you know, farmers have had to revert to other stuff. And I think what, what's really needed is, um, 
you know it's a revolution which which i think is happening in the within farming you know there's all sorts of amazing sort of almost like retrograde steps that are actually incredibly progressive um where you know farmers are trying to decrease the amount of pesticides that they use um i think the ban on neonics or at least the it is is a really good thing because i think it was really really potent stuff um but it's what they use in place and you know there does need to be a huge change in the way that we farm and i i don't have the solution i really feel for you know i feel for farmers they they they've got it really hard but um i do think we have the ability to you know if we have the ability to make this stuff we've got the ability to you know we can solve problems um but um and i'm not a conspiracy theorist but you do wonder about some of these big uh companies like syngenta and yes you know ugh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> okay, well, on that positive note that we think think we can improve Let, let's call that at end and thank you again coming and giving us this talk. Um, you can further show your appreciation by making a contribution to Wild Oxfordshire uh, using a link I am just about to post on the chat. And great news, this will be match funded by the Big Give for the next week, over the next week, in honour of Earth Day, which, for any of you who didn't know, including me two days ago, is this Thursday, the 22nd of April. Um, Finally, you can go further by educating your friends or children on the importance of bees, wildflowers, and then beyond that, the impact of climate change and the fragility of our entire ecosystem. Uh, we plan to have further talks in the next few months, and we'll announce them on our website, Facebook page, and in our e-newsletter. And hope they'll all be as informative, as excellent as this one. Thank you for all your time this evening, and good night. Okay. Badgers. Uh, Alison Whitby, Badgers. <laughs> if she's <still> there. <laughs> really? <laughs> badgers, Badgers, Shrikes. Yeah, Badgers and Shrikes. Excellent. All right, well, uh, <laughs> well, let's say thank you as well to Penny who's Hutton, who set all this up. Thank you, Penny. Okay, I'm going to close it down. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.